truth. Today, you're, you're here to commemorate St. Pelagia at every liturgy. Today is the feast of St. Pelagia the Repentant. There are two stories about her conversion, but her life, we know her life very well. She was a courtesan, a high-class prostitute. And she used to spend a lot of money on her appearance. Uh, decorate herself with jewelry and makeup and fine clothing if she was a high-class prostitute. And one day, the, the story differs here, but one day she was being carried on her sedan chair. You know, wealthy people were carried by four slaves usually on a sedan chair down the street, and there were some bishops gathered having a sobor and outside. They always would meet outside unless it was raining. But anyway, they were on the patio and she went by on her sedan chair and Bishop Nonus looked at her and he turned to the other bishops and said, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? The other bishops were scandalized. Why is he looking at her? Why is he calling her beautiful? He says, look how she adorns her body for to please men. If we would spend the time to adorn our adorn our souls like this for the King of Glory. How wonderful it would be. But after he was praying about her, he couldn't forget because he saw something special about her anyway. And one night when he was teaching in Antioch, but teaching again in the courtyard, she came by and she stopped to listen to what he was teaching. He'd been praying for her all this time. And she heard his words. Something inside her was deeply moved. And she came off of her sedan chair and asked to be baptized, to repent of everything. And afterwards, she was moved to go to Jerusalem and she built a little kelly, a little cell, outside the city gate. Just a small window there. The friends would bring her food and water. But like Mary of Egypt, great passions require great struggle, especially when you've been addicted to them for a long time. In the fullness of time, she gained such a reputation that the monks used to come to go to confession to her through the window. People would come by the growth. They want to go to confession to St. Pelagia the Repentant. And she would hear that, like Sarah of Egypt, she heard the and Hulda of Britain, she heard the confessions even of the monastics. The men would come. And uh, she transformed the lives of so many people around her through her struggle. That we celebrate her as one of the great saints. That's why I commemorate her every Sunday. Because her life is deeply moving. And as Macrina had theology of the heart and theology by knowledge, Pelagia had theology of the spirit. She lived the theology of the church. She lived the commandments of Jesus Christ. And through her humble struggle against her own great passions, she transformed so many lives around her. And the gift of grace that radiated out from that little window in her cell. And we oftentimes wonder why did some of the fathers go into the desert? Why did some of the holy mothers take such a huge struggle? Because we never know what was in their heart, but those who went into the desert, through their prayers, held the world up. They prayed and struggled for the whole world. Since we have only one nature of mankind, when one member becomes filled with light and less darkness, the whole of the human nature is filled with more light and less darkness. We all share together as one people, as one body of humans, fallen humans, but our nature is one. When one struggles and becomes filled with light, there's less darkness for all of us. The whole human nature is lifted up by each person who struggles. And if their struggle was so great, and then they had to, to go someplace and isolate themselves in order to struggle. Sometimes we can stay in the city and have the desert in our hearts. 
And some people can go to the desert and have the city in their hearts. But these people went to the desert and had the whole world in their hearts and understood from our Lord Jesus Christ that their struggle wasn't for themselves only, but their struggle was for the whole world. And uh, so we gratefully commemorate our Holy Mother Pelagia, the repentant today. And uh, well, have an icon of her before long. But to remember these great Holy Mothers that we often forget, Sarah, Mary of Egypt, Thais, Halda of Great Crowland, and uh, Pelagia of Jerusalem. She was in Antioch, but she went to Jerusalem to struggle. And uh, we're so grateful that we can commemorate. When we commemorate the saints, it's our family album, you see. The icons, it's our family album that we're looking at. As if we sat down and opened an album and see our ancestors, see our grandfather, our grandmother, our great-grandfather, our great-great-grandfather. These are our family, and that's our family album on the walls. But it's also a testimony that Holiness shouldn't be a rarity, and holiness is not merely an attitude. The holiness is a transformation of the heart, and it's open to every human being. You see the saints on the wall, this is the destiny of everyone who will take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ. So that's uh, our, our beloved Pelagia that we celebrate today. And remember her, sometimes, I find it amazing. The first Christians were persecuted. Why? We have it in writing. We have it from Pliny, the governor of Nicomedia in the east. He wrote to the emperor and says, they were asked about this, this Christian movement. And he says, what makes the Christians dangerous is that they care for everyone without distinction. Anybody who needs help, the Christians are there. Anybody who needs food, the Christians are there. Anybody who needs shelter, the Christians are open. That's what makes them dangerous. And the emperor had written back to Pliny and said, well, whose poor and sick are they taking care of? Their own or mine? Not that the emperor was going to take care of them. And Pliny said, well, they're taking care of all, everyone, without distinction. That's what makes them dangerous because they care for everyone, because they love everyone, because they reach out to everyone. That makes them dangerous. Unfortunately, we're not dangerous any longer. We should be dangerous again. That's part of our calling, is to be dangerous. Not politically. To stay completely away from worldly politics which are unclean and full of corruption. It's like, I remember my favorite Prime Minister, Don Diefenbaker, I quote too often. He says, in Canada, there's two places for criminals, prison and parliament. So we want to stay away from politics altogether in it. We are full of grief right now for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, and for their suffering, and for, uh, to remember that I was consecrated bishop in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in, in, in Kiev. One of my consecrators was Andrea Ivano Franco, was a close friend of mine as long as he did. But uh, we grieve for that, but we don't want to weigh ourselves down just in politics, because Russians are suffering too. Russian people not only fleeing the country, but suffering in their own country, all Orthodox Christians. So, we have to reach out and cover all of them with our prayers and with our love, without distinction. Just like the ancient Christians, without distinction. Everybody. Let's become dangerous again, brothers and sisters. Like the ancient Christians were dangerous. You know, radical forgiveness, unbridled mercy, compassion without limit. Those are all dangerous to the world. Dangerous to Satan. Nothing is more dangerous to him than unselfish love. Well, let's become dangerous again, brothers and sisters. Amen. Glory to the